Welcome to Cyberbytes the podcast. I'm your host Brody, senior consultant over here at Asperon Search. This week's guest, I'm excited to announce we got Tom Rickoy from Sigent. We're going to delve in deep to his sales experience and find out how he got to that CRO position. Really excited to have him on the pod. I can't wait for you guys to have a listen. Hey Tom, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, brilliant, brilliant to have you on. Um, h- how are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Brody. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Did you uh, did you attend Black Hat? I did. Yes, we were both at Black Hat and DefCon as vendors, so I had a great time. Busy, busy. No, good stuff. Well, um, no, I appreciate you coming on. Um, as I as I was mentioning uh, before, um, I'm running a series uh, story of a CRO. Um, so I'm speaking to to lots of sales candidates, and they're often asking how how do you progress and get into that leadership or that CRO position. So um, I thought it'd be good to to kind of get insights of of people like yourself that are in the the CRO position. Yeah, happy to share. Yeah, awesome. Good stuff. So, yeah, you've got an interesting story, Tom. You've been in sales for for a long time. So, do you want to kick it off and tell me kind of your 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 first job coming out of kind of school, college, etc.? Well, I got started a little earlier than that. So, uh, when I was twelve, I started selling these things called wrist pads for you know computers. This was back when we had Commodore sixty fours and the keyboards were like this tall. And I had actually started got one when I was ten and started programming. And I actually, you know, when you hold your wrist like this. Your wrist actually had carpal tunnel syndrome. So at, 10, at 12 years old, I had carpal tunnel syndrome. And I went to this, uh, found somebody that was selling these wrist pads. And I bought one myself. And I'm like, man, these are awesome. I love these guys. Why don't you come help me sell some at a trade show? So I lived in Southern California, Orange County. And they had these computer trade shows every you know few months at the Anaheim uh, Angel Stadium underneath the stadium. There's an actual convention underneath the stadium. And I would go there at 12 years old, started selling uh, wrist pads. And, and they were like, man, you're a natural sales guy. And I believed it. I was passionate about it. So I sold tons of them. So that was kind of my first uh, sales job. And it kind of just kept going on from then. Nice. So essentially, you've been carrying a quota since 12 years old almost. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they didn't give me a quota then. But that, <laughs> that started immediately after that pretty much. But yes. Yeah, good stuff. And then kind of where did it go from like your first professional role? So going after school and college? Yeah, I had an interesting, you know, start. So I actually started when I was 16. So I got my first computer job. There's a store down the street called Computer Land. I remember riding my bike down there and, you know, saying, hey, I want to work here. What does it take to work here? And well, we don't have a job. I'm like, I, but I'll do anything. So I ended up, they let me work for, you know, a couple hours a day. And within no time, I was you know, working full time there. Um, I was a sales you know, account executive and also ran their technical department. And it just honestly kept going. I ended up getting my degree later on in life um, and started, started working as a salesperson from 16. So it didn't take much longer from 12 years old to 16 to have a real full-time computer job for me. And just honestly, I've been going ever since. Nice. Nice. So when you were at computer land, were you, was that an individual kind of role It was, but I was also a manager of the technical department. So I've always been very technical as well as into sales. And so I loved, you know, tinkering around and building computers and things like that. And so they wanted to, you know, grow the technical department because we had a lot of people bringing computers that they wanted fixed. And uh, we ended up hiring a couple of people and I ended up managing them at like 16, 17, 18 years old, you know, being my first manager of of people that were significantly older than me, which is always very interesting and, and a good growth experience as well. Yeah, definitely. I can relate to that. When I was in a property, I I actually was managing a, a, a team of kind of real estate agents. So at a young age, so that was very uh, very yeah. nice to me. And they, they were also older. Um, yeah. No, awesome. So after computer land, then you went on to be uh, an international sales manager. T- tell me a bit more about about that. Yeah, so I got really, you know, blessed and lucky that, you know, pretty much around 18, 19 years old, I ended up getting to work for an actual manufacturer. Uh, we were at a company uh, called Premax originally that uh, changed to become Action Tech that are still around. And Action Tech, uh, we were selling PCM state cards. We were one of the first companies to do that. For those of you who don't know what those are, this is a long time ago, but they were cards that about the credit card size shaped and they would plug into a computer. And that was before we had modems and network cards and network adapters that were built in or any wireless was not even in our ideas at that point in time. And so I just I was lucky enough and blessed to be able to work for the original founder. We wrote a business plan together. I was one of the first 10 employees and he said, look, I want to start selling into Europe. 
And so I remember, you know, I remember my first sale there that we were, you know, we found this company in Czechoslovakia. This is when it was Czechoslovakia still. And he says, Hey, I want to, I want to be your distributor here in Czechoslovakia. And I want to buy, you know, a hundred PCMSA cards, 50 of this kind, 50 of that kind. And I remember spending the night at the office i stayed up all night because we didn't have anything but fax and phone so there's no email there was no way to get a hold of them and he said you know i want to buy i'm gonna buy today so i stayed there at the office and i remember i got the order the first order there and the the, the founder walks into his office i'm falling asleep I'm sleeping on his couch He's like what are you doing here i said i got the order i got the order you know so that kind of led to us really having an amazing experience of selling you know pcmsa cards and multiple brands all over europe um and then it just grew from there to international you know south africa australia new zealand etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's kind of how it all got started nice oh, awesome and here's a is a bit of a, a cool question so back then obviously cold calling compared to now i mean what what would you oh. say what would you say like <laughs> the biggest difference was or was it easier back then or uh it depends on what you're trying to do um i've had multiple cold calling jobs where you're you're just cold calling people or companies or distributors or partners i remember um you know, back in the the early days of computer land, you know, little, you were literally going door to door. I remember, you know, hey, there's a business park with a bunch of companies. Let me go knock on. I'll literally walk in and say, hey, I, I sell computers. You know, um, you know, I think that's how how we got started. And it depends on what you're trying to sell, but I think nowadays there's a lot of email, which is really annoying, honestly, because a lot of people are getting tons of emails from all sorts of people trying to sell them. Um, but I think that definitely the digital era and the shift to communications has made a big change. At the end of the day, it comes down to the same thing, which is, you know, do I have somebody, do I have something that I think somebody wants? What is the ideal profile for who I'm trying to sell to? And then reaching out to them and saying, hey, look, I have something that's unique and different. And normally it all comes down to still like, who do I know that knows somebody there in a decision-making uh, role that I can be able to get an introduction to? Because at the end of the day, that's really what what works the best. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that um that saying always sticks. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Um, Absolutely. I mean, back then, um, not having the the kind of the, the like the social medias and everything like that, it would be, uh -huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> who, who do you know that's around the, around the corner? <laughs> yep, for sure. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. And then in terms of your your first kind of proper kind of leadership position where you're managing a big, big team, was that at your time at Dell? No, I actually started earlier. So I ended up selling all these PCMSA cards to lots of different companies. Um, I'm starting another, you know, kind of wrapped up that for, I did that for about 10 years. And one of the companies that I've been working with was a company out of Germany that had been the largest brand in Germany for uh, Sony. They were the you know premier distributor for them and they'd been creating their own brand called Anycom. Um, and I had been working with them, you know, selling them the PCMSA cards of Anycom brand, et cetera. And, uh, you know, around I, that time, you know, when I was transitioning between a, a, that role to a different role, I was just looking for my next exciting gig. And so I called them up and said, hey, you know, are you guys doing anything interesting? And they said, we were just talking about the fact that we want to take this Anycom brand and make it into its own company. Um, that was when Bluetooth was just getting started. Like nobody had ever heard of Bluetooth at that point in time. There weren't wireless networks or anything. There wasn't Wi-Fi even. This is really early on. Um, and he says, we have, we just signed this this deal with um, a group, you know, out of Sweden. And we think we, we have the first Bluetooth products to sell. And we think we can sell them all over the world. Would you be interested in, in helping us? And I said, sure. And I said, well, what title do you think I should have? And they said, well, we think president and CEO would be nice. And I'm like, well, okay, let's do that. You know, and they wired $30,000 into my personal checking account and said, okay, go create a company. You know, and that was really kind of what, what led to that. And that was an amazing ride being the first ever Bluetooth company in the world and being able to sell those solutions. And we had the first deployment of, of for wireless, honestly, communications between, you know, a vehicle and a, in a you know, an, an infrastructure with wireless antennas and access points ever done. You know, and so we were able to go use that and take it to do keynotes all over the world and things like that. So it was a really amazing experience. So that was really the first um, you know, role in a leadership, you know, where we had some some amazing experiences selling a lot. Yeah, nice. No, amazing. And what would you say was the biggest turning point for you going from an IC to to leadership? I would think I, but that definitely was for me the big turning point. You know, I'd always been doing different things. I helped start a company too, even prior to that with a friend of mine from high school. And so I got a little bit more experience in that entrepreneurial leadership role. Um, but definitely that that time at Indycom was the one that really turned it um, and gave me that experience that I needed. 
Um, I would say beyond that, it was Dell. You know, Dell was probably a really great experience also for me to be able to work for one of the most amazing companies in the world, a Fortune 50 company, and to have an incredible team and an incredible company and to be able to really make some impact in products and in cybersecurity and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a bit more about your time at Dell. Were you brought on to, to build a team or what did it look like? Yeah, I already had it. There was already a team there. Um, and so I joined initially to be able to lead the group that was responsible for operating systems and also our third party uh, consumer and small business software that we sold with PCs. And that led to an opportunity where I had McAfee. So kind of my first kind of foyer into um, cybersecurity was then, apart from some things I did younger in life um, that were uh, not quite the same things as selling cybersecurity. Um, but uh, so working, you know, at Dell and, and I ended up getting really passionate about our, our relationship with McAfee and about what we were doing for people and customers and small businesses to be able to help protect them from attacks. And I kept learning a lot. And there was an opportunity where we wanted to go build a whole team uh, to do nothing but data security product management. Um, and so I ended up taking that opportunity and that led to uh, a great amount of responsibility around not only data security, but around endpoint security and everything that we did there. And that was just a, an amazing ride. And it was it was kind of a role that was a little bit different because it wasn't a direct sales role. I didn't have a quota, uh, but I had been passionate about, I'd been in the field, I'd been selling for a long time and everybody who's in sales knows like when you're in the field, you're like, man, I just wish the product guys would do this. Like, why won't they do this? That's what I could sell so much more, you know? And so it was great to be able to be in a role where I could be able to engage with the sales team, engage with the customers, figure out what we needed and build a strategy around, you know, what products can we go put together that would allow our reps to be able to sell more and to be that advocate for them within the business. And so it, that was kind of my first uh, really experience there doing both a product management role and a sales role, you know, at a company, any, anything like Dell. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And is that how you, you fell into cybersecurity or did you, did you kind of, you, you knew that that was going to be an upcoming thing and you wanted to go into that? No, I didn't know that. I had done some, um, and I kind of alluded to this, but when I was younger, when I was in my early teen years, I had done computer programming and we had BBSs and there were different things that I wanted to go do that if I wanted to go do them, I, you know, I couldn't quite afford them. And I made some really poor decisions when I was younger in that for a few months there and, and got kind of into hacking and ethical, not ethical, non-ethical hacking, if you will, to be able to learn, you know, some things there. And it was really a, a very eye-opening experience to see kind of the other side of things. Um, and, but then, so then when I got into Adele and I started seeing what McAfee was doing and it just was just a draw for me, uh, cause it was this combination. I had also got a degree in programming. So it was a combination of kind of a lot of things that I had seen and done in my, you know, my personal life of programming, combining that into helping companies to be able to defend against attacks. And then it was when this opportunity came to do this leadership role for the security team, uh, that that's kind of really, really when things started for me and from a cybersecurity perspective, you know, and I made it intentionally was, you know, became a student of the industry and, you know, had some incredible mentors that were willing to and let me ask good, now in hindsight, a lot of dumb questions, uh, but they were always made sure that I never felt dumb with all my questions and I could be able to get all the answers I need. And I went to all, every trade show I could possibly go to. We went to Cyber Week in Israel, went to RSA, of course, in Black Hat. And I would actually go to the track, the talk tracks, and just soak it all in and learn as much as I can. Um, but yeah, that's really where, where cybersecurity started for me. It was about 10 years ago at that role, at the first role hotel. Yeah, awesome. No, good stuff. And just, just on that, in terms of um, being a successful sales candidate, do you think that them having a technical background is is more needed in the market today or...? It depends on the job. I think it greatly depends on the job. I've seen a lot of sales reps who are amazing and they're not the technical folks. Um, so it depends on what you're selling. You know, I was at a company called Bizarre Voice here in Austin. It was an amazing experience. And, you know, we were selling uh, basically the ratings and reviews uh, back end software that you see across the internet. And, you know, you don't need to be a deep technical person to be able to sell that. You need to be smarter, honestly, on the non-technical things to be able to sell that. But if you look at something like what we're doing here at SideGen, it's, it is something that in the beginning, that a little bit of technical depth will really go far because you are selling something that's unique and different. It's not that I'm just taking, you know, something that a bunch of other people have already sold and just, you know, rinse, wash, repeat and do that. I'm actually selling something that I do have to have a little bit of depth so I can be able to understand, you know, what the customers are asking, respond to that. 
but generally speaking, the depth of a technical of a sales rep does not need, need to be that technical because they always have a partner, you know, and a sales engineer that comes alongside them and helps to take those conversations to the next level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in terms of like a, a startup, I think it's they're, they're looking for more technically uh, active sales candidates because they want them to do the demos, et cetera. They don't want to be leaning on the, 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 the sales uh, engineers so much early on in the sale. Um, so yeah, t- tell me, tell me about Sergeant. What, what is it they do? Yeah. And just to piggyback off of what you said, I think in a startup too, it's also about being able to, as a sales rep, vet opportunities, right? Because you don't have the obvious playbook that you might have later on in a company when it's, it's brought, it's larger, you're dealing with that, you know, initial call where you have to ask a couple of questions to be able to say, you know, is what, what is their pain point? What, how are they, what technology do they have? Do I have a technology that fits that? And can that be a real opportunity or do I need to just walk away from that because I'm going to spin my wheels for a long time. Um, so about SciGen, uh, we, we've been around for a little over five years, five and a half years. Uh, but we came out of a company that's been around for 35 years and the technology that we're, we sell today, we started working on about nine and a half years ago. Um, SciGen is really about data security. And every time I say that, I still laugh a little bit inside because I heard somebody say that all cybersecurity spend is about data security. Um, but what's different is we really do get as close to the data as we possibly can or as, as possibly anybody can, which is two places. One is in the actual individual files themselves. And the second is in the actual storage. Uh, so what's different about SciGent is uh, the first thing really is lots of things, but we we take the idea of multi-factor or two-factor authentication and we bring that down to the file level and the storage level. Um, so I can require MFA or 2FA to be able to access data, actual files, and to unlock parts of a storage device. Um, and you can't get really closer than that. And no one's done that. No one's ever taken it and said, you know what, I'm going to you know, apply this concept of MFA down as low as close as possible as I can. Um, And that's just one of the kind of the beginning with us. We go into a lot more. And, you know, one of the things I'm super excited about is that we have the ability to detect ransomware on a storage device from within the storage device. We have machine learning and AI that looks at the data access patterns of the drive and can delineate, you know, between a ransomware and a non-ransom where, you know, encryption and, and read write patterns and be able to actually prevent ransomware right from within the storage, you know, automate the whole thing. And so, I mean, that, that kind of innovation is really what I think is going to take over um, in the world where we are able to actually stop ransomware attacks once and for all. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. There's obviously a lot more and you can check it out at SideGen.com to hear all the details, but uh, that's the high level. Yeah, awesome. No, it sounds like you're on to, uh, to something exciting there. And um, in terms of your, your role then, so you were brought in as, as VP of sales and kind of uh, public sector alliances. So yep. tell, me, tell me about your journey. Yeah, when I, when I joined here, initially the idea was just to do partnerships, uh, was to be able to help out with you know, our, our, our uh, partner network. I had been doing that at Dell. Also, I built relationships with companies like Silence and CrowdStrike and Carbon Black and RSA and you know Microsoft goes on and on and on. And so it's always been something I've loved to do is the partnership relations. So when I came in here, they said, hey, listen, you know, you have experience at Dell, you know, the PC industry. We think that this is a good fit for Dell and, and others in the PC. Would you come in and do that? And I said, sure. Um, um, but shortly after I got here, I realized that, okay, we, we, we've got some initial funding and partnerships within the government as well. And you know what, I, I, I know, I know enough to be dangerous in the public sector and in the federal government space, because at Dell, I was responsible also for the federal, uh, ecosystem of solutions that we had for our PCs. And so I, I knew how to talk the lingo, the lingo, if you will, the certifications and about the market and who the, who the players were and things like that. And so within like a couple of weeks, it was like, you know what, why don't you do that too? <laughs> you know, so I ended up taking that on and we built that out and, and really grew that business, those two businesses um, for a couple of years. And then we ended up having a company that we were able to spin out of SciGent called Blue Shift uh, Cybersecurity, which is an amazing uh, you know platform to be able to fully manage uh, organizations' uh, security for them. And we spun that out. And so one of the leaders, one of the founders here uh, here at SciGent left and went over there to lead the sales and marketing. And they asked me to step up to be able to take on all sales and marketing here at SciGent, which I obviously gladly did and was thrilled to do. Um, so that's a little bit of the journey of how I got into this uh, CRO role. Yeah, awesome. So tell me now, you've been in the CRO role for about a year and a quarter now. So mm-hmm. tell me, what, what's your duties at the moment? 
Yeah, so I think the CRO role is a little bit different than your average uh, VP of marketing or SVP of sales and marketing. Uh, here at SiteGen, it's it's ob obviously I'm responsible for sales and I sell every day I can, possibly can. That's what we were doing at Black Hat and DEFCON is, you know, selling to individuals, selling to companies and, you know, building relationships with everybody. But it's really about not only the sales side, also the marketing. But to me, when I think about a CRO role, it's also about the strategy. It's around the big picture. It's around the markets. It's around you know, where do we want to focus our efforts on? There's so much to do, and we are a small team, as most companies are, and we have to really focus in on a few different things and get those things right. Um, and it's also about the partnerships. It's about the OEM relationships. It's about our engagement even with some of our, our suppliers and vendors and how we work with people in the storage industry to be able to get our technology built into their storage devices. And so CRO role is a little bit bigger in my mind in that sense from the, from the scope of what you think about it. Um, necessarily responsibility, but the scope of what you think about and what you're trying to drive within the organization and the vision that you can give um, for the company and for the team. Um, and so in my mind, that's really what, what we're doing here and what I'm doing here at, at SciGen. Yeah, awesome. I, I love that analogy because a lot of people think that a CRO role is just literally in charge of revenue and bringing it in from the sales aspect and not the marketing mm -hmm. and the bigger picture. So right. tell me a bit more on that, on kind of what what you've been doing in in, in terms of putting the two together. Sure. I mean, so for SideGen, it's an interesting uh, model, right? So as a startup company at this at this time, and one thing you learn over time and in a career is that things shift. Like, you know, the valuation of a company has shifted in the last few years to it's a multiplier of your SaaS revenue. Um, if I were to do this 25, 30 years ago, I would be focusing more on licensing agreements to storage manufacturers like Sandus did, you know, back in the day with a standard called ATA, because that was what made them, you know, very valuable. But nowadays, people don't value that as much as they value simple things like, you know, SaaS revenue and, you know, recurring revenue and what percentage of your, you know, customers are renewing and how much can you grow that? And so, you know, for us, we're thinking through, um, not only that, and how do we build that revenue stream, but we have storage capabilities that are best embedded into storage. And we're not a storage manufacturer. You know, we're software guys who have great ideas about software that should go inside of storage. And so there's this big uh, effort that we're, we have going on where we're working not only to create the SaaS revenue partnerships and partner with the PCOEMs like Lenovo. We just announced uh, a week or two ago that we're going to be partnering with Lenovo. They're going to be rebranding our software and selling it with their PCs all over the world. Um, but we also have to work through the effort of getting the supply chain of storage vendors on board. And we have this amazing partnership with a company called Fizon out of Taiwan, uh, P-H-I-S-O-N, if you want to look them up. And being able to partner with Fizon, one of the world's greatest uh, providers of controllers and storage devices in the world, to allow them to help us get to the ecosystem of all the rest of the storage suppliers has really been a big part of the play. Um, and then also to listen to customers as they say, listen, we want to be able to take your technology and put it down into micro SDs and get those in SDs and micro SDs because we have handheld devices or IoT devices or whatever it is. And being able to say, okay, how do we go do that? You know, that's a different play than it is the average, you know, supply chain storage providers for your PC OEMs. Um, so that's a lot of what we're doing is working on that. And then also taking the technology we have and looking at even a longer, bigger picture vision. Um, which ends up being data center storage arrays. You know, how do you take and put ransomware prevention into a cloud, which we're working on? You know, we're going to have that in a year. We're going to have the ability to have ransomware detection and prevention inside of a cloud array. You know, so taking this whole thing and really getting it to the point where it is bringing the maximum value, but also aligning the different business models and sales plays to have a SaaS model on top of a hardware infrastructure storage uh, implementation is really what we're focused on right now and what I'm focused on with the team. Wicked. Uh, amazing. Sounds like some big stuff's definitely happening with, uh, with Sergeant. Um, incredible. Cool. So, so just to, to kind of wrap up, um, what advice would you, would you give younger people looking to progress their sales careers? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things. I'll just pick a couple of them, but I would say that to start, you know, don't be afraid of kind of going backwards. And in a sense, what people view as backwards. And so about halfway through my career, I had an opportunity to go work for a, 
you know, a, a family owned, you know, sales company here in Austin that sold, you know, telecom equipment and got into IT and things like that. And, you know, that wasn't me progressing, you know, up the chain and, you know, better title than the last job and better money. It was actually all the opposite of those things. But man, getting that experience again, because when, you, when you're in a manufacturer, you're in a big company, you kind of lose touch with what people are dealing with at the ground level. And that was one of my greatest experiences was spending a couple of years, you know, knocking on cold calling again, you know, and knocking on doors. So I think that's one of the things um, I think also just being a student of, of sales is really important. You know, I, I have read a bunch of books on sales. I've read a bunch of books on leadership. Um, and I think that that also is a big part of it. And then just getting a broad set of experience, um, but within a segment is important, right? So having the opportunity to learn about selling hardware, learning about selling SaaS software, learning about selling security. And then all of that culminated in me having the right kind of ideas and knowledge and experience that led to this being just a natural fit for me where it's easy for me to do and where I love it. Um, and then I think the last thing is, for me at least, and I, and I think most sales people would agree, but finding something that you're really passionate about and that you're excited about to sell is critical. You know, you can take a role where you're selling something that you're not too excited about, I guess, um, but you're gonna be way more successful. And if you go focus in on that, you know, something you really care about and really believe in, because you're gonna sell that, you know, without even trying, honestly. And then I, I would say last but not least would be to find a great team and then to, you know, aim for the stars. You know, go for that big job, work for the company that is, you know, the number one company that everybody in Austin wants to work for. I did that. I got to work at the, you know, best place to work for seven years in a row here in Austin. And it was an amazing experience. So I, those are my two, a uh, couple of advice uh, tidbits for everybody. Yeah, I love that. I think um, I think the, the main one for me that resonates is, yeah, just don't be afraid to take a step back and, and keep doing the basics. Um, they're, they're, yes. they're the core values, I'd say. Yep, absolutely agree. Yeah, good stuff. Well, um, Tom, it's been amazing having you on the uh, on the podcast, and um, really thank you for having me, Brady. Appreciate it. In the uh, the the success of Sergeant, but um, yeah, I'll uh, yeah, I'll stay in touch with you, and we'll we'll catch up soon. Yeah, look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, thanks, Brady. Take care, Tom. <laughs>